Pastor Dave Winger, I'm blessed to serve as your pastor, and man, it's so good to be home. We were in Texas last weekend uh, to celebrate with uh, a sister church, Hallmark Baptist Church, and their 75th anniversary of ministry, and we had a great time, and it was good to see my oldest daughters. Uh, I couldn't talk them into moving to Georgia. They have Texas boyfriends and Texas jobs, Uh, but we are glad to be back home. And I know last Sunday, yeah, well, hey... I'm clapping for you too. And uh, last Sunday, man, Hopewell did not miss a beat. We had an incredible time of worship and an incredible message brought brought by our worship pastor, Clay Marchbanks. He did such a fine job, and I'm so proud of Clay. And, uh, you know, some guys, God just gives a double portion, you know. They can sing and preach, and I don't know about that. But, uh, man, it's so good to see you. I love that that last line in that song, Jesus, yours is the victory, we included the words, woa. Did you notice that? <laughs> Jesus, yours is the victory. Whoa. Ah. Because that's how we should feel about that. Because Jesus' victory is our victory that we enjoy as well, those who are in Christ. Turn your Bibles to Colossians 3. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll join you there in a minute. Uh, Colossians three twelve through 15. Um, this week is number three in our core values series. And the first week we looked at the fact that we here at Hopewell value biblical preaching and teaching. And we looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which reminds us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We believe that God wrote a book, and it's the Bible, and it contains everything we need to be complete in Jesus Christ. If it's not in there, you don't need it. And that's our first core value. We value biblical preaching and teaching. Then last week, Pastor Clay brought an incredible message from Colossians 3, 16 and 17 about Christ-centered worship. We value Christ-centered worship. Colossians 3, 16, 17 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We value biblical preaching and teaching. We value Christ-centered worship. Well, today, we're going to look just a little bit before that passage in Colossians 3 about a third value. We value authentic community. Authentic community. It's a core value. And so I've had you turn to Colossians 3. Let's stand together and honor the reading of God's Word. And we'll read verses 12 through 15. Paul writes, Therefore, as the elect of God... What does that mean? Well, it means that God voted for you. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Father, we thank you already that we can celebrate together as a faith family because of what you've done for us on the cross and the fact that there's an empty tomb. Jesus, thank you for the victory that we enjoy. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over hell and the grave. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. And Jesus, help what was important to you be important to us. In John 17, you prayed for our unity, that all those who would trust in you would be one. Lord, it's important. Help us to see that today as we look at this passage of Scripture. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, before we jump into this passage and others, I want to define authentic community for you. Community is kind of a common catchphrase in our culture today, but we value authentic community. What does that mean? Well, the word authentic means not false or imitation, but real, actual, true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. When something is authentic, it's valuable. When something is authentic, it's vulnerable. We value authentic community. That's what authentic means. What does community mean? Community means a unified body 
of individuals, a group of people with a common characteristic or interest, common character. In other words, common unity. The word community comes from common unity or unity around the things that we have in common. So when we here at Hopewell say that we value authentic community, what we're saying is we want there to be real relationships happening here. Unity around common core beliefs and principles of people with genuine character. And the Bible has a lot to say about this topic. And so this morning we're going to consider four facts regarding authentic community from God's Word. The first fact about authentic community is, number one, authentic community is encouraging. It's encouraging. Life is hard. Would you agree? Life is hard. But it's encouraging to know that we do not have to face the challenges of life alone. That's not God's intention. Paul says in verses 12 and 13 of the passage we just read that we can bear with one another and forgive one another and show tender mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering with one another. And some people may make you suffer longer than others, you know, with this whole long-suffering thing. But at least we know we're not alone. We do not have to face life alone. That was not God's intention. And in Galatians 6.2, Paul tells us to bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Maybe you've been walking through Target or Walmart, you, you, you purchased a large item, and on the box there was a picture of two stick figures uh, lifting the object together. And what's the word by that caption? It says, team lift. Life is a team lift, right? And maybe you're like me and you try to do it by yourself and get that big item in the cart by yourself, you're going to hurt yourself. If you go through life alone and you ignore the team lift label, you're going to hurt yourself. Life that we live is a team lift. God designed us to go through life with other people, to have community with them. We need help. God said it Himself in, uh, in the garden when He made Adam. He said it's not good for man to be alone. And in Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Even if you're single here today, you need a friend. You need a friend to go through life with. In fact, I would say that you need a team of people to go through life with. Because life is a team lift. Some of us is better than one of us. I need you, you need me. And I'm thankful for the authentic community that we have here at Hopewell, we have it in our leadership structure. We enjoy authentic community in our staff, our life groups, and in our ministries. You know, our church staff, we, we pray together. We joke around together. On most days, we eat lunch together. Uh, we just enjoy spending time together. We enjoy authentic community with each other because when we, when we get together, we find encouragement. It's edifying. It builds us up. It lifts us up. Life gets a little easier when you're doing life with friends in authentic community. The book of Hebrews describes authentic community as this in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. My family's been at Hopewell over a year now, and I feel like we're getting to know each other, you know? Sometimes when you first meet people, especially in church, you have a tendency to wear a mask, right? We put on our mask, our, our church person mask that's always smiling. You know, we wear a permagrin and we walk around and people ask, how are you doing? What's the answer? I'm fine. Fine. Even when we're not sometimes. How's it going? I'm fine. Even though you're heartbroken. You doing okay? Great. Even though things are falling apart. We have a tendency to wear masks when we're in community. That's not authentic community. Authentic community is real relationships. It's when the mask comes down and people see the real you and they love you anyway. That's authentic community. People discover that you're just a human being and they love you anyway. 
That's where real encouragement takes place. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've got to be real. Someone here at this church told me when I first came to Hopewell, Pastor, your preaching gets better every time you call me by my first name. It's true, right? People like to be known. And they like to know others. Authentic community is vulnerability. You have to pull the mask down. But it is so valuable. Because it's encouraging to know that even though someone knows you for who you really are, they love you anyway. They love you anyway. The longer I'm married to my wife, we've been married 26 years, the longer I'm married to my wife, the more I love my wife. Do you know why? Because she knows the real and the raw of Dave Winger, and she loves me anyway. Isn't that what God does for us? God knows the real and the raw of your life. He knows every detail about you, not only what you say, not only what you do, He knows what you think. And do you know what God says to you? I love you. I love you. That's authentic community. And by the way, that's how we're to love other people. Authentic community is encouraging. But number two, authentic community is also exciting. You know, community should never feel boring or forced. In fact, I think it should be the opposite. I think it should be fun. When you're with people that know the real you, that's when you can really let down your hair, right? I can't let down any more hair. I'm starting to thin. But, you know, for those of you that can still let down your hair without fear of loss, that's, that's when you can just be yourself. And that's when you can have the most fun. I think authentic community is exciting. Psalm 133 one says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. King David said in Psalm 122.1, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. He anticipated being with others who loved him for who he was. All, our culture can sometimes portray Christians as pretty boring people. But that couldn't, or at least it shouldn't, be further from the truth. Believers can be goofy and witty and fun and funny and fun to be around. Community has a higher purpose than that, I understand, but it should be enjoyable to be with people that love you for who you are. One of the greatest things that my parents ever did for me growing up in church was to show me that you can still laugh and have a good time as a Christian. You can have fun. One of the ways that Hopewell broke me in was uh, hosting the junior high boys for D-Now <laughs> at my house. We invited all the junior high boys to come over and hang out with Pastor Dave. Uh, they only broke one door, so it wasn't a big deal. We were able to put the door back on its hinges. But one of the things I quickly found out that was a part of D-Now is pulling pranks on the other host homes that night. And so I had the junior high boys, and we were warned, and somebody tipped us off that the senior high girls were on their way uh, to mess with the house. And so the junior high boys wanted to feel ready and prepared for that, so they gathered all the Nerf guns in my house and all the Nerf, um, the Nerf bullets, and they loaded up, and we got the tip that the senior high girls were coming and were actually on our street, and so all the junior high boys were locked and loaded, and we ran outside in the dark, and we were hiding around the side of my house waiting for the senior high girls to approach. We were going to let them have it. Thinking back on that, I didn't realize that we'd have to clean up all those Nerf darts that was actually going to backfire on us. Well, sure enough, we see the van pull up and it waits in the cul-de-sac and then here come the senior high girls and man, they were ready. And you know how when you're waiting to surprise somebody, you get really nervous and I don't remember quite who the junior high boy was that was hiding with me on my side of the house, but he said, Pastor Dave, I have to pee really bad. <laughs> he said, will you hold my gun? I'll be right back. And so, bless his heart. He was, it was so intense, you know. Well, the... <laughs> Here they come, the senior high girls, they come and, and, and as they approach the front yard, the boys come out screaming and yelling and we're, we're peppering them with uh, Nerf darts and they're hitting us with stuff and throwing streamers all over my house. And I started to see that their faces were painted green, these senior high girls. And some of the leaders, I was like, wait a second, I recognize, and I see Rebecca Bennett standing in my driveway <laughs> with their face painted green and she knows that I know who it is. And she's like, hey, Pastor Dave, and she's riding on my van. <laughs> As I'm talking to her, I'm like, the gig is up. And she's like, hi, and she's riding on the van. 
And then they asked if they could refill their water guns because we were just the first stop among many. And so I'm over there with the garden hose <laughs> trying to fill up water. And I look up and there's our worship pastor's wife, Whitney, with her face painted green. I said, Whitney, is that you? She goes, I know, I'm sorry. They pulled me into it. I'll tell you, we had a blast. We had a blast. And then my crew, the junior high boys, wanted to go and prank the senior high, so they drove off, and I stood there to clean up, and then the middle school girls come to my house, and they're sticking forks in my yard with balloons and stuff, so I watched them do it. I just stood back there in the window and watched the girls. We had such a, we had such a good time. But you can have fun. You can have fun and be a Christian. Guys, authentic community is, is exciting. There's no place I'd rather be on a Sunday morning than right here with you guys. Why? Because I love you. And we have fun together. I know when I come to this place that I'm going to be encouraged, that I'm going to laugh, that I'm going to sense the presence of God in my life, that I'll be challenged to follow Jesus. There's nothing like authentic community. It's exciting. And by the way, Jesus was funny. Did you know that? If you read through the New Testament, just for example, Matthew 7, 4, he was teaching his disciples about personal holiness. And he says, how can you say to your neighbor... Here, let me get that splinter out of your eye when you've got this giant wooden plank in your own. That's funny. It's a carpenter joke, right? And then when he's talking to the, to the, uh, to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 24, he said, you blind guides, you're filtering out a gnat. You're careful to filter out your drinking water so you don't swallow a gnat, but you're swallowing a camel, right? I mean, picture that. Somebody's filtering out their drinking water, but there's a giant hairy hump of a camel you know, uh, going around in their mouth. That's hilarious. And not only that, but it was, it was wordplay. You see, he was speaking in Aramaic. And so when he said that, it was a play on words. He said, you filter out a galma, which is a gnat, but you gulp down a gamla, which is a camel. Brilliant. I wouldn't want to play Scrabble with Jesus. <laughs> he would eat your lunch. Jesus was funny. Garrett Gillickson said that seriousness is not a fruit of the Spirit, but joy is. We should be joyful. Authentic community is exciting. And some of you need to let your face know that your soul's been saved. (laughs) I mean, you do. Grumpy Christians should not be in the same sentence. Philippians 4.4 says that we're to rejoice in the Lord always, always. Have you ever been to a church that lacked exciting community? Have you? Yeah. The first church of the frigid air. Or Ichabod Baptist Church, right? You have to check your bulletin to make sure that you're not in a funeral home at somebody's service because it's so quiet and sullen. Dead, no joy. My question is, how can you be so dead when you serve a Savior who is alive? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today, right? I know that He's living whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. When I was a little kid, we used to sing, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart, right? Well, let some of it up to your face, all right? (laughs) Because authentic community is exciting. You can be yourself and be loved. Listen, a church without exciting community will soon be a church with exiting community. I'm telling you, if we don't show the love and the joy of Jesus Christ. We're not effective in reaching others for Christ. Romans 15, 13, now may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. And may you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Authentic community is encouraged, encouraging. Authentic community is exciting. And number three, authentic community is empowered The Bible tells us that the manifest presence of God is evident when believers gather together. Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. In the early church, we see a great example of that. It says in Acts 2, 46 and 47, that they made a habit of meeting together, eating together, worshiping together, and as a result, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was a manifestation of the power of God when they gathered. And there is every Sunday here at Hopewell Baptist Church. 
And I would say that while being in worship every Sunday is very important, what we just did here, you will be encouraged. The Holy Spirit of God will change and transform your life. The real transformation comes when you find a life group, a smaller group of people that can know you and that you can know that is where God will do work in your life and in your heart. Because that's where the one and others of Scripture are fleshed out. That's where you bear with one another. That's where you show mercy with one another. That's where you suffer long with one another. That's where you build authentic community. And I'm telling you, when you get in relationship, authentic, real relationships with other Christians, God will do a powerful work in your life. That's where it happens. That's the secret sauce. As always, Jesus leads us by example. Think back to his three and a half years of earthly ministry. There were concentric circles of authentic community in even Jesus' life. There, were, there was the, the outer ring. There was the crowd. Think of the 5,000 that Jesus fed. Miracles happened there in that corporate gathering, yes. But then there were smaller circles. There was the committed. We see 120 people in the upper room. That's where power was given to be witnesses of him. Then we see an even, an even smaller circle of community in the 12 disciples that he called and he trained for ministry. Then from the 12, we see an even smaller inner circle of a core of disciples, Peter, James, and John, that he personally discipled and he empowered them to lead the early church. But it's in those concentric circles of authentic community that the Holy Spirit shows up in power in your life. Learning to do life with other people. Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another person. The sanctifying power of God will work on you as you flesh out and live out the one another as described in Colossians 3, 12 through 13. That's where it happens. God uses real relationships to teach us about ourselves, to teach us about others, and to show us more of His grace. We need it. Not only is authentic community encouraging and exciting and empowered, it is finally, number four, essential. Authentic community is essential to your life with Christ. In Romans 12, 4 through 5, Paul says for us, we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I'm essential to you. You're essential to me. I'm a part of your sanctification. You are part of my sanctification. Authentic community is essential for you to be all that God has called you to be. I guess I could say to you like Tom Cruise in the movie Jerry Maguire, you complete me. You complete me. And I complete you. We're part of each other's story. God set it up that way. And I know for some of you, it's hard to commit to authentic community because maybe you're guarded, maybe you prefer solitude, maybe you refuel away from people. But until you connect with people in authentic community, you will never be all that God has called you to be. God designed us for it. It's also God's desire for us. Willingness to participate in it is a sign of mature faith. Because at the end of the day, when we grow in relationships with others, we're growing in our relationship with Him. The body is getting stronger. We are part of one bride, one building, one body. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The book of Ephesians is an incredible book of application. The first three chapters deal with our wealth in Christ, and the last three chapters deal with our walk in Christ. There's very practical things that we can apply to our life from the book of Ephesians. A lot about the body, a lot about how we function, not only as a church and individually, but also in marriage as we parent our children, uh, as we function at work, God, Paul really gets down to the nitty-gritty in the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace." There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, 
in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And then down in verses 15 through 16, he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This means that when you get better, I get better. It means that when I get better, you get better. We help each other grow in authentic community because we're part of the same body. So bottom line, if you're not participating in authentic community with other Christians, you will not grow up in Christ. It will stunt your growth. You will never go deeper in the things of God until you are fleshing out the one another's in authentic community. It is essential. It's essential. We are the body of Christ. You know, my hand is part of my body. And when it functions as a part of my body, you think nothing of it. I can shake your hand. I can give you a high five. I can do the thumbs up. That's my thing. I I like the thumbs up. But if you were on your way to life group this morning and church was over and you saw my hand detached from my body laying over in the corner, it would be grotesque. Something is wrong, right? Because it's not a part of the body. Something is wrong. And a believer who is not attached to the body, an authentic community, something is wrong. You will not be able to function. And by the way, it not only hurts the hand, it hurts the body. We are handicapped without one another. Our sanctification is hindered. It's hindered. You're not serving your purpose. Now you might say, well, preacher, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, that's true. You don't. You also don't have to go home to be married. But if you never go home, you're not going to have much of a marriage. Amen? You need to have authentic community to grow in Christ. You need to be connected with others. When we're saved, we become part of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the building of Christ, which means without you, we would be a few bricks short of a load. We would be a few fries short of a happy meal. Right? I need you. You need me. It's essential. Finding friends in authentic community is essential and takes effort, but it is worth it. You'll never be all God wants you to be without it. You just won't. In fact, when someone tells me they're struggling spiritually, I will usually ask two questions. Number one, what are you feeding your mind that deals with content? And number two, who have you surrounded yourself with that involves community? What are you feeding your mind? Who have you surrounded yourself with? Content, community. Now, When I talk about authentic community, when I talk about finding friends that are going the right direction, I want you to understand that it's not up to the pastors and staff to find friends for you. You know, one of the most interesting things I've discovered in in 26 years of full-time ministry is that people will ask the pastor to help them find friends. And I'll try, but friendships can't be forced. Right? This isn't ChristianMatch.com where you list all your qualities and then I match you up. Well, I think you have a 98% chance with this person. No, we don't do that around here. Friendships can't be forced. They can be facilitated. And so we try to create opportunities and facilitate opportunities. But really, it's on you individually to find friends, to to create that authentic community, to, to find your place. And so let me give you some ideas of how you might find some friends here at Hopewell. Try the following. Number one, be friendly. Be friendly. Be the kind of friend that you wish you had here at Hopewell. Let's start there. Number two, go to a life group and talk to people. Don't sneak in. Everybody knows you're new. Just introduce yourself. That's it. Here's another one. Maybe invite someone that you don't know from church out to coffee or lunch. Find somebody in a similar life stage. Have them over to your house. By the way, Halloween's coming. It's on a Monday night. You know what we're going to encourage all of you to do? If you don't live in a subdivision, find somebody that does live in a subdivision. 
Go hang out at their house. Maybe grow some hot dogs in the front yard. Don't hide in the back. Do it in the front yard. We're going to give you cards to hand out with all the candy. It's the one time of year where all your friends and neighbors will come to your house and ask you for stuff. So we're going to give them the gospel and tell them about our church and give them good candy. Don't give them the the bad candy. Don't give them the hard candy left over from Christmas. Give them the good stuff, right? Do things with excellence. This is about Jesus. But, but invite somebody over. Say, hey, come hang out. You bring something to eat. I'll bring something to eat. Let's spend some time in my front yard and meet our neighbors and tell them about Jesus. We're going to hand you cards to do that. That's an opportunity to meet somebody, to establish some authentic community. This morning, it's, it's exciting. If you look in your bulletin, we have this included uh, insert here of all the people that have become a part of Hopewell this last year. And we, we put their pictures in there. Now listen, if you're somebody who has joined this last year and your picture is not in there, it's because we didn't have your picture. And so you're going to be in our next one, but please let us know. We couldn't find a picture of some of you. And so let us know and we'll put you in the next edition of our new member insert. Uh, My family's in there, but I wanted you to see some new faces that are now a part of Hopewell Baptist Church. There's another reason I did that. It's so that all of you new people can see who else is new. There's a book called Sticky Church by Larry Osborne, and Pastor Larry Osborne talks about this dynamic of relationships. He said we're all, when it comes to relationships and connecting with people, he said we're all like logos, or Legos, not logos, Legos. And Legos only have so many connections. Some have six, some have three, some are real big, they have 20. But we only have so many places to connect. And what happens so many times is that people come into a loving church and they're like, wow, this is the most loving church I've ever been a part of. I will find my best friend at this church. And they try to connect with people that have been in that church for 20 or 30 years and already have all their connections full. They have friendships that go back 10, 20, sometimes 30 years. And it's really hard to ask that person with limited connections to break off somebody that's been there for 10 years and make room for somebody that's new. And so what we want to do is we want to find people that are new that have a bunch of connections that are coming in to find other people with a bunch of connections and say, hey, I'm new, you're new, we're not connected with anybody, let's connect. Instead of being frustrated that you can't break off the connections of somebody that's been here for 20 or 30 years. And so that's another reason we put all these faces in the bulletin. New people, find some new people, because guess what? They're looking for friends too. They love this place. They love this church. They were led here by God. But they probably don't have a bunch of friends here. So reach out to them. Find some people. Maybe they look like they're in the same life stage as you and say, I wonder what they're doing for Halloween. Maybe they come over to our house and have some hot dogs. Or I wonder what they're doing this afternoon for lunch. Or I wonder if they could meet for coffee sometime this week. Reach out to them. Develop authentic community. Find somebody with similar interests. You know, sometimes I'll encounter somebody that wants me to find them friends and they've been to First Baptist Church and they've been to Second Baptist Church and they've been to Community Baptist Church and now they're at this church and they're saying, I need you to find me friends. Bob's having a hard time and I just picked the name Bob randomly. I hope you're not offended if I said Bob and your name is Bob. But maybe if Bob couldn't find friends at First Baptist and Bob couldn't find friends at Second Baptist and Bob couldn't find friends at Community Baptist, maybe the problem isn't First Baptist, Second Baptist, or Community Baptist. Maybe the problem is Bob. (laughs) Have you thought about that? Maybe Bob needs to focus in on growing a little bit, developing some social skills, trying to be the friend that Bob wants to have. Okay? So it's on you to find authentic community. It's on you to find those friendships. But man, there's, there's groups of people for everybody. There are so many different things where people gather around interesting things. And the longer I live, the more convinced I am of that. There are groups for pretty much everyone under the sun. Business Insider did a recent article on the weirdest conventions in America. And the author of the article said, no matter what these conventions are about, where they're held or who attends them, all conventions satisfy a basic human urge. And you know what that urge is? The longing for belonging. Everybody has a longing for belonging. We were designed for authentic community. And so there are weird conventions. We've all heard of things like Comic-Con, but how about the clown convention? There's a clown convention. There's ventriloquist convention. Get this one. There is an Abraham Lincoln presenters convention. 
guys that look like Abraham Lincoln that are asked to present things, they have a convention and they get together. And it's a very honest event. Everybody's <laughs> above board there. There's an international brotherhood of real bearded Santas. Yeah, there's, a, there's an initiation process. They pull the beard, check to see if you can come. There's a mermaid convention. There's a My Little Pony convention. If you're into My Little Pony, yes, there's a convention for you. Civil War reenactors, that one's kind of cool. I think I might go to that one. But if you look hard enough, you're probably going to find someone who enjoys the same things that you do, at least enough to hang out with them and have community. Now, there is such a, ba- there is such a thing as bad, authentic community. Some of you are running with some people, and you have authentic community, but it's bad for you. It's bad for you. And you might say, Pastor, my friends are real. Yes, they're also raw, real, and rebellious toward God. You need to find some new friends, right? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Find some people who who challenge you to be more like Jesus. Find some people who encourage you in the fruits of God's Spirit. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. Not the, fruits of the, not the fruits of the flesh. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, choose the best friends you can, then follow them no farther than they follow Christ. Find somebody who's chasing after Jesus that shares some similar likes and connect with them. And in closing today, I just want to warn you that because authentic community is essential for your spiritual growth, the enemy seeks to destroy it. He comes after authentic community. He will make you too busy for it. You can't have authentic community with people if you're never around them. He'll make you too busy. He will preoccupy you with counterfeit community, social media, right? Surface friendships that don't get real. He will preoccupy you with that. He will sow discord over secondary things. He'll divide people that should be united over things like politics, musical styles, programs, service times, carpet colors. He'll get you focused on things that don't matter to keep you from authentic community. He will also bring people into our fellowship with impure motives. Wolves in sheep's clothing who will backbite, whisper, gossip, manipulate others into suspecting and hating people rather than trusting and loving people. Authentic community is essential and that's why It has an enemy, and we will resist that enemy. As your shepherd, I want you to know that I guard against that, that I am watching for anything that would attack the authentic community in our church. You see, I'm a pretty easygoing guy until Satan tries to dismantle what Jesus prayed for in John 17. Boy, that gets me me upset. That gives me a righteous anger. And and I just want to assure you as the flock of God that you have some shepherds that are really committed to protecting the unity of our church. So much so that we have a church discipline, policy and procedure clearly outlined in our bylaws and constitution from Matthew 18 that is supported by the laws of our land. Why? Because we take unity so seriously, Jesus prayed that we would be one. And anything worth doing is worth protecting. And so I assure you as your pastor that we are protecting. And if some slithering, sneaky, satanic snake comes in here and tries to rip apart the unity of our church, you will be faced with some angry shepherds in Jesus' name. And we will deal with it. And we will uproot you. And we'll send you on your way. And we'll pray for your salvation. But hear me when I say that. I'm an easygoing guy until somebody comes after the unity of our church. So we need to pray for unity. We need to protect unity and authentic community. It's worth it. It's vulnerable, yes. But man, it's valuable. And people can sense it. And they want to be a part of it. Now, Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're not a part of our community of faith. Well, the good news is that Jesus takes outsiders. He makes them insiders. He takes people that 
are away from his family and he includes them into his family. He adopts them in. Now if that's you this morning, the good news is that Jesus can save your soul. He can forgive you of your sin. He can give you victory in life and hope for living. He can save you this morning if that's you. The rest of you, maybe you're a part of this community, but you haven't been authentic and it's time to take that mask off. God knows. God knows who you are. He knows what you need. Be real. Yes, it's vulnerable, but it is so valuable. And you will grow by leaps and bounds knowing that the people that truly know you still love you, just like the Lord. Maybe some of you, your application today, and this is hard, is invite someone to lunch. Go to a life group. Talk to someone. Find somebody in that handout that kind of looks like they're in the same life stage as you. Seek them out and tell them your name. Introduce yourself. And say, hey, we're new, we're new too. What are you doing for lunch? Take them to lunch. Say, that doesn't sound very spiritual. You have no idea just how spiritual that decision can be in your life. Let's stand together as our musicians come this morning. It's our time of decision. These altars are open. If you've been praying about being a part of Hopewell Baptist Church, you'd like to explore church membership, we would love to have you just come down, let us know your intentions. We will get you plugged into the next new members class. We've had so many people come and be a part already, and we love for you to be a part of what God is doing here in this place. But let's do business with the Lord today. If you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, there's pastors across the front. We would love to show you from God's Word how you can be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you for praying for us in John 17 that we would be one. Lord, it's so valuable to to, to know others, to be known, so that we can live out our Christian faith, so that we can apply what you've taught us in your word. Lord, I pray for somebody here that feels alone, that feels like they're going through life by themselves. Lord, they're not alone. They have a faith family, people that love them, people that are on journey with them, people that are imperfect just like them. Give them the boldness and the courage to reach out, to introduce themselves to somebody. Lord, I pray that you would forge some friendships in our church today, that today would be the day, the first day, the best friends meet, that families find each other. Lord, I pray that you would do that in a wonderful way you have done in the past. There are rich friendships of heritage in this place. I pray that you'd start new ones today. Help us as a church to be open to those who have come in to say, I want to be a part of this church. Lord, help us to find some friends that push us to be more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to-